<laughs> the Roman congregation had both Jewish and non-Jewish believers, but starting in chapter 2, Paul is speaking mainly to the Jews, okay, there in chapter 2. So some of them have shown an attitude of arrogance and superiority just because they were Jewish. Well, they grew, and because they grew up with the Torah, they knew it well, even though they weren't living up to the Torah's standards, right? Paul has told them that both Jews and non-Jews have to meet the same requir requirements of life for the kingdom. In the kingdom, even though they were part of God's chosen people because without genuine faith, repentance, and faith in God of Israel and his Messiah, nobody, and I mean nobody, has the ability to know Yahushua or come into a relationship with him or achieve the level of righteousness that he requires Here's another word, everyone, and I mean everyone, all of us are guilty of sin, and we need his rescue. He, that he provided through the life and the sacrifice of his son, Yahushua, Jesus of Nazareth. Now last week we saw how the righteousness of Yahuwah in the Messiah how it was revealed in the Torah and his prophets. We all, I'm going to say that again, we all need his mercy and grace for redemption okay. for Yahushua. Mm -hmm. And that was always the plan. Always the plan. It is through Messiah's sacrificial death that the redemption payment is made and our guilt is removed through our faith and trust in him and what he did for us Paul said in chapter 3 that there's no room for anyone to boast when it comes to being justified before Yahuwah we can't boast most of us don't want to that have a heart for Yahushua His way is the law of faith, which is the Torah of Moses, understood through faith in the Messiah. I'm going to say this again. His way is the law of faith, which is the Torah of Moses, understood through the faith in the Messiah. But we are saved by our faith. Not being Jewish or by the works of the Lord, which means obeying Yahuwah's Torah or even compliance with added rules and regulations and requirements of the rabbis. You know, God judges Jews who are called the circumcised and non-Jews who are called the uncircumcised all on the same basis by faith. Paul has been trying to prove that what makes a person right with Yahuwah is not obedience, but the simple trust that takes him at his word and that we totally believe him. Most Jews in the first century weren't taught that. It contradicted what they had been taught. It was new to them and hard for some of them to accept. <laughs> so Paul will show that. Far from being new, it was as old as their father Abraham. It was actually the basis of their religion. Now in chapter 4, you're going to see Paul move his argument along and prove it. Using none other than Abraham at the first and the most obvious proof. In Paul's day, it was commonly believed that Abraham's descendants could benefit and even claim salvation on the basis of Abraham. Righteousness of Abraham's righteousness. Can you imagine this, this man, whatever 
talking to you from nowhere? Would we have been obedient? I don't know. He was. Oh, Abraham. In Paul's day, it was commonly believed that Abraham's descendant could benefit and claim salvation on the basis, again, of his righteousness. You know, if anyone could have boasted, don't you think it would have been Abraham? So if Paul can show that he had no grounds to boast, then what? No one does, right? Let's look at the first two vo verses. By the way, from now on, for our Bible text, for those to let you know, in addition to the New King James Version, we'll be using the 2009 edition of the Scriptures by ISR more often. In Romans 4, 1 and 2, What then shall we say, Abraham our father, to have found according to the flesh? For if Abraham was declared right by works, he has ground for boasting, but not before Elohim. Abraham was a father of Jacob, the father or forefather of all ancestors of all Jacob's descendants, which includes all the people of Israel. And all, thank you, Lord, genuine followers of the Messiah are as well included. In Galatians 3.29, and if you are of Messiah, then you are the, we're all seeds of Abraham, aren't we? And heirs according to, that's right, to the promise. Many, okay, many Christians, okay, don't realize that Abraham is a spiritual father to all who belong to Messiah, whether they're Jewish or not. Not interesting. It seems that in Paul's day, some rabbis believed that Abraham was justified in his willingness of sacrifice to sacrifice his son Isaac. But Paul disagrees. If Abraham has been declared righteous by any works he did, then he would have had grounds for boasting. But his righteous status was the result of his faith in Yahuwah and believing what he said and what he promised. He had nothing, again, to boast about. In Romans 4, 3, for what does the scripture say? Abraham believed Elohim, his God, and it was reckoned to him for righteousness. Okay, to prove this, this is good. To prove his point, Paul goes to the Tanakh. It's known as, in Hebrew, Tanakh, the Old Testament. That's right. And it quotes, if you want, Genesis 15, 6. By the way, if you think that, oh, this is good. You're going to love this. I used to make fun of my precious husband. Saying, I reckon so. Well, I reckon. Well, my mother, an English major at St. Mary's, didn't realize that we couldn't say reckon. But I thought it was a weird word. But you know, my husband says here, if you think the word reckon is a redneck word, it's actually a very old English. And guess what it means, really, when you study the word reckon it means to count to calculate to estimate to consider and it goes back to the 13th century in England I reckon so I'm gonna say that more often then honey I really love that word now I reckon Abraham is a model of faith for us isn't he like Abraham we must not only believe in Yahuwah we must believe that what he says is true. If we don't really believe what he has said, we don't have real faith. We're guilty of the sin of unbelief. And we must base our action on belief that what he says in his word is true. Someone who has real faith acts faithfully. 
That's real faith. And these principles apply not only to becoming righteous in his sight, what we call getting saved, but also to receive healing. For those, I'm going to interject. For those who are struggling with sickness, my husband, as you know, has been diagnosed ALS a year ago, almost in May, and that's what the doctor gave him. Yes, I struggle, and I'm hurt, and I'm scared sometimes, but let me tell you, I still put my blinders on and look up. I can't let the world in, folks. Look up. Look up. That's what we need to do. That's what I will do. Even when I'm crying or laying on the floor, kicking or saying to my precious husband, what's God doing? What's he doing? He's not doing it to me. He's Satan, Satan, however you want to call him, the devil. He's doing this, trying, trying hard to persuade us not to praise our Lord God. I refuse. I will praise him in my tears while I'm walking, while I'm sitting, while I'm lying down. Oh, hallelujah. Oh. There's nothing we can do to earn salvation or healing without true faith and really believing what Yahuwah says. We can't be saved or healed. We have to believe that word. Get into the word. Study the word. Look at the word. We must believe the word. We have to. We have no choice. If you love God, you will do this. With true faith and genuine belief, we receive salvation and spiritual healing. And we receive then physical healing. If we truly believe. According to Messiah in Mark 11, 23 to 24. And if we do not doubt. Forgive, forgive, just say forgive us Lord for doubting. Bring me back to the faith of Abraham. There's one exception, and my husband says this, and I can hardly say it here. If it's his appointed or our appointed time to die, otherwise genuine faith and belief will lead to healing. You are an amazing man. Yes. Truly an amazing man. And faith for healing can be the faith of the sick person or the faith of a person who is ministering to the sick or of another believer. Well, ex for example, let, let, let's use this. It can be a person who has authority over the sick person, like the noble, nobleman uh, for his son in John 4, or the centurion for his service, uh, servant in Matthew 8. That always amazed me. I'm not good enough, Lord, for you to enter into my house. But say the word and my servant will be healed. He had more faith than most people that Yahushua could even find. All believers can and should minister healing to the sick. Here at Hallelujah Messianic Fellowship, our precious people... Continue to pray for us, and we appreciate it so much. Yahushua tells his disciples to heal the sick in Matthew 10, Luke 9, and in Luke 10. He appointed 70 to go two by two, healing the sick and preaching of his kingdom. Abraham had real faith. Again, he also presents a model of obedience for us. Years after Yahuwah made the promise to Abraham, he reaffirmed the covenant to Abraham's son Isaac. In Genesis, if you'll look at 26, and in this passage, we learn that Abraham obeyed 
Yahuwah. In Genesis 26, 4, 5. And I will make your descendants multiply yes. as the stars of the heaven. Yes. Can you imagine? Mm -hmm. a lot. Oh, man. I will give to your descendants all these lands. And in your seed of all nations of the earth shall be blessed. Yes. Can you imagine? Me? Abraham? Because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. That's what we need to tell people to do and to understand. Because that's what Yahushua did. That's what Jesus did. And this was long before Torah was given to Moses at Mount Sinai. Yahuwah must be and have revealed at least some of his commandments, statutes, and laws to Abraham. He had to have. I mean, how else could Abraham obey these? Mm -hmm. oh. Amen, Abraham. <laughs> Hallelujah. I reckon so. <laughs> By his initial... His initial righteousness was because of his belief, not his obedience. Romans 4, 4, 5. Now to him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, grace but as debt. But to him who does not work, but believers on him will justify the ungodly. His faith is accounted for righteousness. You know, wages are earned by the worker and are owed to him. They are not a gift of grace or favor. And faith or belief is not work. You know, it's wrong to think we can cause God to owe us anything because of what we do. Well, you know, God, you owe it to us to be healed? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. He doesn't owe us anything. We owe him. And the object and the object uh, and the object <laughs> object objective of truth saving faith is Yahuwah. The God of Israel revealed in his son Yahushua, Jesus, who declared the wicked as righteous when they believed in him and repent of their sins. Yeah, you can turn around. I did. You can. Amen. Amen. The ungodly who believed and repent are declared not guilty Amen. because he paid the price. Messiah paid the price for all redemption. We receive the gift when we believe and repent. And he recreates us and puts his Ruach HaKodesh, his spirit within us to empower us to obey him and live in righteousness. Many times I got on my knees because I was somewhere and was accused of something I didn't do. I got on my knees and he always comes through. Always comes through. By counting us as righteous now, he treats us on the basis of what he will help us become. One more thing. Paul's statement in verse 5, if you have your Bibles there and you're looking, has nothing to do with good works that flow out of saving faith, which prove our faith and help to maintain our righteousness but rather to the works done to try to earn forgiveness and salvation. Just as faith without works is dead, works without faith is also dead. In Romans 4, 6, just as David also describes the blessedness of the man to whom God imputes righteousness apart from works. Okay, in this verse... Paul paraphrases the words of David in Psalm 32, 1 to 2, as a second witness. That Yahuwah reckons, there I love it, there's that word, or counts true faith as righteousness. You cannot get it by works or deeds. What David says is that Yahuwah uh, 
putes no crookedness, can't hardly say that, crookedness, or equity of sin. And Paul understands that to mean that God imputes righteousness. Then he goes on to quote the passage from Psalms 32. In Romans, blessed are those whose lawlessness deeds are forgiven and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord shall not impute, pute, sin. You know, verse 7 is an example of something that, that's common in the Tanakh Old Testament stating part 1. Something twice as, with different words. Lawlessness deeds are forgiven is the same thing as sins are covered. That shows that sin are lawless deeds. Deeds that break God's law just as 1 John 3, 4 says. And if you look up the Greek words in Roman 4 and the Hebrew words in Psalms 32, forgiven means lifted off, carried away. <laughs> Covered, out of sight, yeah. hidden. Yeah. I love that. So to Paul, reckoning, <laughs> reckoning, or imputing righteousness in verse 6 and not counting or imputing sin to a person in verse 8, they're the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, when we're forgiven for our sins, we are righteous. As far as salvation is concerned. We're either righteous believers or unrighteous, unforgiven sinners. Woo! I like that. In or out, hot or cold, alive or dead. Halfway in or lukewarm. Sorry, won't cut it. There is no neutral position. Get on one side of the fence. You can't straddle it. Yahuwah makes that clear in these words in Matthew 12.30. He who is not with me is what? Against, Against me. Mm -hmm. I mean, can't say that any more plain, right? And he who does not gather with me scatters abroad. Be sure your faith is real. If we don't generally believe in Yahuwah, and his son, and if we don't repent whatever we need to, he will count us as being against him. We don't want that. Look in Romans 4, 9. Is this blessing then upon the circumcised only, or also upon the uncircumcised? For we affirm belief was reckoned Unto Abraham for his R. For R. For plain righteousness. What blessing is Paul talking about here in verse 9? It's the blessing of being forgiven through Yahushua, Jesus, being covered with his righteousness. Remember that when Paul says the circumcised, he means the Jews. And when he says the uncircumcised, he means those who are not Jewish. Some of the Jews thought that God's forgiveness was offered only to the people of Israel. But that's not. Paul says something different. Paul tells them again that forgiveness and being counted as righteousness, it's not only for the Jews. And he uses Abraham, this is good, to prove a point. He quotes Genesis 15, 6. And he believed in Yahuwah, God, and he reckoned it to him for righteousness. He makes it very, very clear that it was Abraham's belief that was reckoned to him as righteousness. Abraham. He totally believed what Yahuwah said and completely trusted him to keep his word. He didn't argue. He didn't even hesitate. He just believed Yahuwah and acted on that belief. I can't imagine. What? Did we totally believe what Yahuwah said? 
Do we completely trust him and keep his word? Do we base our actions on that belief? Do we do that? We need to. That's what Abraham did. That's what real faith is. Abraham's belief as righteousness. Romans 4.10. How then was it reckoned? Being in circumcision or in uncircumcision? Not in circumcision, but in uncircumcision. You know, Yahuwah reckoned... Uh, 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 reckoned Abraham's belief to him as righteousness in Genesis 15. But circumcision wasn't given as a sign of the covenant until Genesis 17. It was 14 <laughs> years later. So Abraham was uncircumcised Gentile. Amen. When his righteousness was established on the basis of his belief. He had genuine faith to believe this. He obeyed the command to be circumcised. You know, obedience flows from faith. Not the other way around. In Romans 4.11, and he received the sign of circumcision, a seal of the righteousness of the belief while in uncircumcision. For him to be a father of all those believing through uncircumcision, for righteousness to be reckoned to them also. Again, circumcision of the flesh, flesh was not the way a man became righteous. Was not. Amen. It was a sign of the covenant. Circumcision of the heart. Your heart's got to change. It's reflected in humble submission to God and His Word and His Son. It's much more important. But the physical circumcision sign was also a seal and a guarantee of the righteousness that would be given to all who have genuine faith in Abraham's ultimate descendant, Yahushua, Jesus. The success of the covenant God made with Abraham depended on the promise Messiah in whom all nations of the earth will be blessed. Can you imagine looking up at the stars and God says to Abraham, count them. That's how many of your descendants there are going to be. Well, you can't count them. <laughs> so Abraham is the father of all or ancestor of all who believe, whether you're Jewish or not. Amen. All believers in Messiah are part of Abraham's family. And we receive the blessings that were promised to him and his descendants. Don't forget, it says in Galatians 3.29, We who belong in Messiah are the seed of Abraham, his descendants. He is the father of his family. Romans 4.12 And the father of circumcision to those who not only are of the circumcision, but who also walk in the steps of the belief which our father Abraham had in uncircumcision. Those who are not only are of the circumcision means those who are Jews legally, which means nothing as far as salvation is concerned. To have righteousness in God's eyes, Jews and Gentiles both alike have the same faith that Abraham had before he was even circumcised. Again, the only way to be counted as righteousness in the sight of our God is to believe in Yahuwah and his son and to repent of sins. Faith is to be confessed or declared in public. And the final step is the official formal recognition of that faith 
and confession by being immersed in water. And these requirements are the same for everybody, everyone. And because we received the status of righteousness through Yeshua, Jesus, we actually become the righteousness of a God. In 2 Corinthians 4, he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of Elohim. Oh, hallelujah, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.